Funding for the Maddie Report is made possible by grants from the California Emerging Technology Fund, leaders in the quest for digital equity. The James Irvine Foundation, committed to a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. Fresno State Associated Students, Inc. Students serving students. BNSF Railway, moving our economy for 160 years. And the wonderful company. The Maddie Report is also made possible thanks to contributions from Harris Ranch Inn and Restaurant and E&J Gallo Winery. From the Maddie Institute, the Public Policy Institute for the Valley's four public universities, this is the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. Being connected to the internet is more important than ever. The Valley, however, suffers from a digital divide. There's a problem between the haves and the have-nots. What can we do about that? California's nonpartisan Little Hoover Commission may have some answers. We're delighted to have the commission's chair, Pedro Nava, as our guest. Welcome back to the Maddie Report. Well, it's great to be with you. You know, it's been a long time since we've had a chance to talk. I know. I'm glad we have, we're having this opportunity. It's certainly a very important topic. Um, let me ask you this. Before we get started, let's talk about some basic terms and concepts. It's get thrown around to the non-techie types. They, don't, they really don't know. I include myself in that group. What are some of the uh, different types of broadband connections? Well, there's, there's essentially three types. So there's the DSL, which is the phone line. Uh, that's the, the slowest, but it's the most affordable. A step up from DSL is cable, which most people will get through their cable provider if they're uh, uh, hooked up with someone to watch TV. And then the fastest and the best, but also a little bit more expensive is fiber. So the, the fiber uh, uh, internet availability is where you have your faster speeds. And quite frankly, it's what California needs in order to compete with other states and also with um, other countries. Yeah, yeah you know, it's state competitive. You've got to be on the cutting edge for sure. Um, let me ask you this. So can you briefly explain the fiber brand, uh, broadband network in short and what types of fiber do you need to go into your home? Well, you know, this is, and I, I'm going to forget this as soon as I say it or read it. There's, you've got, you have FTTH, FTTB, FTTP, which is fiber to home to business or premises. Uh, and that is the fastest, um, but- Wow, that's like that's like alphabet soup. Uh, yeah, well, I know, which is, which is why most people just sort of go to their cable provider and sign up for it. Uh, but you also have fiber to node or your neighborhood, mm -hmm. and then you have fiber to curb or cabinet, which is a box that is uh, attached to your business or to your home. So okay. there's, there's at least those three different uh, kinds of approaches. Okay, so how do you define how if an individual is, you know, quote unquote, connected? Well, you have your downstream speed and you have your upstream speed. And the downstream speed is actually like what you download. So um, uh, when you go and you use your internet with your uh, e email and the rest of that, you're downloading information, you're downloading images. The uh, up, upstream is when you are sending things from your device to somebody else. Uh, through the internet. So uh, the FCC, the uh, Federal Communications uh, uh, Commission, defines broadband, which is what we're talking about, as speeds that are 25 megabits per second. That's where you hear the MBPS for downstream and three megabits for upstream. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that there's, there's a different number there. You'd think that the numbers would be the same. Yeah, but 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 they're not. Apparently, what uh, most people rely upon, obviously, is the downstream speed. It is when you connect to uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, you want the fastest speed possible so that the images and the text arrive at your computer uh, uh, quickly. Uh, upstream seems to not uh, be quite as important for certainly most consumer use. Yeah. So so how do we you know, talk about how does the U.S. compare, for example? Um, you know, how many, first of all, how many Americans have, you know, meet that benchmark? And then how do we compare to other countries? Well, it's interesting. The FCC uh, in, in a report uh, uh, tells us that 21.3 million Americans lack a connection to the internet that meets the FCC definition of broadband. Again, 25 megabits uh, download, uh, three megabits upload, downstream, upstream. Um, 
And there is an organization that's called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which surveys uh, countries all over the world. And uh, the United States of America is ranked 31st out of 36 of the o OCED countries. So th the point that I was making earlier with respect to uh, international competition, uh, we're like in, at, at 31. That's yeah, not- we're, we're not doing well. And one of the things I noticed in your report, you're talking about US cities pay more for slower internet than, than other cities around the world. For example, for $50 uh, in US cities, um, you're getting between 25 and 45 Mbps. You go to Hong Kong and Seoul, you're getting 300 right. um, Mbps for, for the same price. And even in Paris and Tokyo, you're getting 200. So they're 10 to 12 times faster Absolutely. for the same money, right. uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm in Santa Barbara. and. Uh, the service we have here, because um, uh, both my wife and I work out of out of our home, so we get 150 megabits per second. We pay about $75 a month for that, 150 megabits. Now the next step up is 500 megabits, and to do that, it's going to cost us almost $100. So the 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 providers, the internet service providers, um, uh, because of a lack of competition, are able to do two things: have slower speeds and charge more money. <laughs> that's like the worst possible combination, right? Um, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask. Let me ask you this. Um, you note in your report uh, that the these numbers uh, it may actually be an underestimate. Why? Why is that? And what are the implications? Well, it's an, it's it, it, it's sort of an interesting uh, approach that the FCC does, and and I think most people wouldn't do it that this way. But they they decide uh, internet access based on a census block. So a census block is a geographical area uh, uh, that is specifically defined. And so the FCC says, if we find one person within a census block, then we consider that everybody in that census block actually has broadband. It's a fiction. It's a very strange fiction um, that doesn't seem to me to be based on a reality. Right, right. Just because one person has it doesn't mean everybody in the, in the, on the block has it. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like if my neighbor has a Cadillac Escalade, I guess we assume that everybody else has one. <laughs> right? Would it be so? Um, yeah. So, so what are the implications of that? Well, the implications of, are that in planning, um, uh, it makes for poor planning, and there is federal money that is available to communities to help them expand their internet access. But if the FCC, based on what I consider to be a faulty analysis, comes to the conclusion that your census block in your city already has adequate broadband, then you're not going to get federal dollars to expand the services. So you may in fact be deprived of the opportunity to have the broadband that you need because of this faulty assessment by the FCC. We're, we're running out of time for this segment. Just real quickly, where's California stand? Are we better or worse? Yeah, you know, we've got 94% of Californians have access to broadband, but there are other places that have higher percentages of communities with broadband. Okay. We need to improve. Yeah. Well, how do, what do we do to improve the Valley's digital divide? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. Uh, our guest is Pedro Nava, the chairman of the of California's nonpartisan Little Hoover Commission. They recently issued a report on closing California's digital divide. So um, first, uh, a lot has been made of the fact uh, about the quality and, and quantity of broadband access. Uh, it really comes down to, you mentioned this earlier, it comes down to one word, competition or the lack of it. Um, what did you find? Well, I, what I found was that, uh, you know, businesses talk about the importance of competition um, until they have to do it. And then they don't like it so much. So what happens is the internet service providers actually carve up territory. 
so that they don't end up competing with another internet service provider. And so that ends up with the, uh, higher broadband prices. So when you have areas that are served by monopolies, which is what happens when you have one entity that controls it all, those 35% those, uh, lower, those speeds are 35% lower than areas that have competition. Yeah, so competition is absolutely key. So one thing that's been discussed is something called uh, municipally owned fiber networks. Can you explain right. how that works? Well, I mean, you brought up the point uh, earlier about uh, the Fresno area um, and broadband speed in communities there. But what is happening with with broadband is the same sort of sort of thing that's being done with providing uh, energy to communities. They form their own municipally owned fiber network. And so, as an example, you know, there's nothing that stops Fresno, uh, if it chooses to do so, from uh, uh, commencing to build their own internet uh, uh, network. So, if Beverly Hills can have it, no surprise. But also, Truckee, as an example, Truckee has uh, is a public utility that has fiber network uh, and broadband speed for the, its residents. So, so one of the ones that's pointed to as an example, a very successful model happened in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, what exactly ha happened? What happened there? I've been to Chattanooga. I have seen that internet. It's like it almost burned up my phone. They have routinely provide people with a thousand megabits per second at a price that is around $75 uh, for that much broadband. But what they did, and it was smart, they knew they had to upgrade their electrical system. And so when they upgraded it, they also added fiber to it. So they, and they did that deliberately so that they could attract uh, uh, businesses, internet businesses to the, to the area. They got $100 million, $111 million from the Department of Energy and used that to help subsidize the cost of providing that service to people in their community. They serve more than 100,000 homes and nearly two thirds of the homes and businesses in that community get a thousand megabits. And that's incredible. I mean, the speeds yeah. are right better than, than you'd find in, in, in Seoul and, and you know some of the top places in the world. Yeah. I and mean, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right. Uh, what's interesting about that is the, is the kind of the dig smart you know the idea right. that if you're dropping cable or you're re, you're reconstructing a road or something that you're doing the fiber optics at the same time. It's just it's just planning, right? Um, right. right. Good planning. You know, measure yeah. measure twice at once. Yeah, you have to you have to have elected officials that have a vision. And so in Chattanooga, they did. And what they also found was that they generated jobs. The estimates for Chattanooga are anywhere between 2,800 and 5,200 new jobs. And then in terms of economic and social benefits, anywhere from 865 million to $1.3 billion attributed to building up their, uh, their broadband system. Yeah, and it would also it also seem that it would attract you know new investments. I mean, if you have a situation where you said it's funny, there's a great analogy that it was burning up your lines. It was so fast. Um, <laughs> you know, you're going from from 150 to to a thousand. That's like a you know going in a car you know 150 to to a thousand miles an hour. That that's a, a big increase in speed. Right. Uh, that it would seem to attract new businesses. Well, and 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 they did right. What what they did in Chattanooga besides um, uh, improving their uh, broadband capabilities uh, was they also had some tax credits to attract businesses to that community. And so they've got, they've got uh, Amazon and VW expanded into Chattanooga. They have uh, uh, startups that are there in some larger numbers, as well as uh, new venture capital funds are based in uh, Chattanooga. Because also what you'll find compared to California, and I love California, I'm not moving, I'm not leaving, but the cost of living in Chattanooga is, is substantially less than a place like California. Yeah, and that that that's interesting. You know, um, I happen to have a niece who is uh, working for a data analytics company in New York City from San Diego, um, and I think this is the new world. Yeah. You know, um, well, up next we're going to talk about several attempts to close the digital divide. Some successful, some not. You can learn from both. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. 
Uh, this is Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. You know, the saying goes, no one bats a thousand. That's particularly true when it comes to cutting edge technology. Uh, there's some attempts to uh, close the digital divide that have been less successful than others, but they can tell us something as well. Our guest is Pedro Nava, the chair of the nonpartisan Little Hoover Commission, uh, who's done a report on closing the state's digital divide. So let's talk about some of the broadband efforts in California. Uh, first of all, this is not a new issue. Uh, cities have attempted to address uh, broadband access in their communities for some time. Uh, you, you would think, you know, San Francisco, for example, with its proximity to the Silicon Valley, would be a model uh, example. Not so much. Um, what did you find? Well, you know, this is a this is an example of what I always talk about with people that there's a difference between in politics and the policy is that you want to have broadband for all your residents, but the politics become a, a, a problem. And it seems to me that when you have communities, large populations and lots of different electeds and thousands of stakeholders, you're going to have uh, uh, complications. So San Francisco is an example of a place tried really hard to try to develop a plan, but it just never got off the ground. Um, at one point, they decided it looked like it was going to cost one dollars to uh, build out their fiber network. But then people in the community said, shouldn't we spend that money on housing, given how expensive housing is in San Francisco? So it just sort of just never got enough momentum to be successful. Um, and I understand that the, uh, the new mayor uh, has uh, wants to revisit some sort of broadband but it doesn't look to be this, as comprehensive as initially thought about. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I, I don't even know for this program because we're, we're doing it remotely. We're hoping the sound and the video come through clearly. Um, and I guess we'll see that in, in the editing process. Uh, it, as they say, it is what it is. Um, yeah. But I just want to let our audience know we're, we're doing the best we can in, in a difficult circumstance, trying to get good information to you. Um, and by the way, to the extent that you miss anything, after viewing this program, please go on to the Little Hoover Commission website and read the report. Um, it's, it's, it's chock full of information. Let me ask about Los Angeles. That was another example of things that didn't, didn't work out so well. Yeah, you know, again, I mean, you take a look at Los Angeles, it probably has more population than some uh, foreign countries. Um, but they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to provide internet service, broadband to every resident. They did a, a, a study and found out the existing infrastructure uh, wasn't capable of doing the job. So if they were going to expand the broadband, it was going to take a significant amount of money. Then they divided the city up into what they call four quadrants and say, oh, like, you know, how are you going to provide broadband to this particular quadrant? And they had talked about internet uh, service providers giving discounts and using, leasing some of the city infrastructure, but that didn't work out either. And then they figured out it was going to cost three to $5 billion to do it. Um, and nobody came forward to, uh, uh, to assume that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. So that didn't work out so well. But, you know, they, a lot of people say that government's the problem, right? Um, set up all these hurdles to stop innovation from happening. That's really not the case in California, is it? No, you know, and, and we've got some some legislators that have done their job and they've, they've done it appropriately. Uh, back in 2018, there was Assembly Bill 1999 expanded the authority of municipal and public utility districts to develop public broadband services um, and to apply what they call net neutrality so that uh, uh, it would be a fair uh, way for entities to become involved. Um, and so you can do it if you have the leadership and the vision and the willingness to take that step forward. So communities can use that legislation and develop their own broadband infrastructure and figure out how to partner with public, uh, do a public private partnership to get it done. Okay. So, you know, there's been some missteps, no question about it, but there's also been some success stories uh, in closing digital divide. What have they done and how have they done it? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report.
Welcome back. I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. You know, we're talking with Pedro Nava, who's the chairman of California's nonpartisan Little Hoover Commission, about how we can get internet access uh, to those who are still not connected. Um, you know, one of the things that you've talked about in your report is something called dark fiber. It's kind of an ominous name to it. It's unused fiber cables that have not been lit by internet service. Uh, it's an option that's being used by 16 cities um, down by uh, in LA. Apparently, they set out to create a, a broadband ring using the available dark fiber. How did that work out? Well, it worked out really well. Um, first of all, they had a, what they call a Measure M, which was a self-help transportation tax. And they were able to make the nexus between internet speed and transportation services so they could use $4.4 billion from that measure in 2019. So they created the core ring which was the middle mile network architecture. And in that they had what they call, what you identified as uh, dark fiber. And all that, all dark fiber means is that there's no service being provided uh, through it at the moment, but it means that it is available for leasing uh, uh, to entities that wanna use it. You know, let me jump in here for a second. You know, just you were talking about this, the tax on Measure M in, in LA County. Um, in Fresno County, for example, it, it's also a self-help county. They have something called Measure C. And so it deals with trans self. It's, we tax ourselves for transportation projects. And so what, what, what it sounds like what they did in, in, in L.A. is they took that money and said, hey, we can synchronize lights. There's a there's a traffic connection. And so we can do that with this, you know, with the dark, dark um, fiber. And as a way also one of the added benefits is, is you increase speeds and, and accessibility to the Internet. So kind of a double hit, which is you know, an efficient and effective use of tax dollars, I, I would think. You know, another one you talked about in your report was Santa Monica. Um, what I found interesting there was they started way back in 1998 with a telecommunications master plan that kind of created a strategic roadmap. Um, as a result, they were very successful in implementing uh, this uh, public-private partnership model. Uh, what can you tell us about Santa Monica? Well, you know, what you, what you said was accurate in terms of, you know, a public-private uh, partnership. So what they what the city agreed to do is lease institutional fiber network right for city buildings, um, so that the the city services would be connected with high speed internet, um, uh, using a local cable company. So it cost about five hundred thirty thousand dollars that was paid by the city to put that together. The cable a company and the city shared the uh, operation and maintenance costs going forward. So then they were able to also include the school district and community college, uh, that helped the, uh, those institutions reduce their costs by $400,000 a year, huge savings. And then those savings grew to $500,000 a year. The city then reinvested the money to help build its own 10 megabit municipal fiber optic network. And what they did, again, like Chattanooga, they adopted a dig once uh, policy, which means that they reduced installation costs by 90%. So you had some smart people doing some good work in the city of Santa Monica. You know, um, the valley, there's a difference between, you know, inland California and, and the coast. I'm just wondering, I want to get your perspective on what does closing the digital divide mean for places like the San Joaquin Valley? That's that's often lagged other places in California when it comes to, you know, educational attainment, economic development, healthcare outcomes, et cetera. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Um, and I think you're, you're accurate. There are two Californias. Um, you have coastal communities that have um, tremendous benefits, big population growth, uh, revenue being generated there. And then you have our rural counties and rural communities that don't have the same opportunities. And so you've got, even though the cost of living may be lower in our rural uh, communities and the populations there are as deserving as everybody else, they tend to suffer from a lack of services. And so I think the state of California and, and Governor Gavin Newsom spoke of this early on about the two Californias and about how more attention needs to be paid to rural uh, to rural areas. Uh, we are one California and everyone should be treated in a way that respects their dignity and provides them with economic opportunities. Well, th well I want to thank our guest, Pedro Nava, chairman of the California's Little Hoover Commission. And I'm Mark Kepler with the Maddie Institute. Thanks for joining us. The views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the California Channel or the Maddie Institute. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions expressed on the Maddie Report, visit our website at maddieinstitute.org.